So we're going to jump in this morning. We are in a, in a study on the book of Philippians. And so Philippians chapter 2 is where we're at. Last week we kind of introed it and had chapter 1. This week, chapter 2. And if we can, as you're turning there, we'll dive in and read it. Um, Philippians chapter 2, and Paul begins by saying this. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And your attitude, therefore, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then he goes in poetically here to say, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He continues saying, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, when I was in uh, grad school, you come to this passage, and it's a famous passage in, in theology. It's a famous passage in church history. It's called the kenosis. And so the kenosis is kind of a noun form of the Greek word uh, kanao, which is basically the emptying out uh, when it says that Jesus didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Um, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a certain servant. He, he emptied himself out of his divine attributes or his divine gifts and became human. So the second person of the Trinity came down and was human enough that he wasn't kind of floating along the, the, the surface of the earth um, as a divine figure. The, this kind of later on, late, late first century and definitely into the second century, was the Greek kind of Gnostic heresy. The, the, the Gnostics or Greek dualism really thought that matter, physical matter, was inherently corrupt or evil and that spirit was kind of good. And so there's no way that, that Jesus or the, the second person in the Trinity could actually take on flesh, uh, corrupted flesh, evil flesh. And so the idea was that Jesus was kind of this apparition, this, this thing that floated along with kind of a halo above his, his head. And so because this is kind of the beginning of, uh, the beginnings of this happen in John's lifetime, you, you see John begin his, his letters by, we saw this, we witnessed this, we touched Jesus. This, this person was human, right? Um, but so in this passage, we get this whole kind of theological um, conundrum of what is, it, what is it really like for Jesus to be human, but also to be the second person in the Trinity? And so you'll debate about it and debate about it and say, what does that kenosis really mean? What does that really look like? Did he have him, but just like ignore him? Like if Michael Jordan went and played with some second graders like in basketball, did, did Jesus have the skills, but just not avail himself of them? Or did he kind of literally set them aside in coming down to earth so that he, he gave them up or, or chose to kind of separate themselves, uh, them from himself? I mean, what does that really mean? That, that's, I've got absolutely no interest in talking about that today. That doesn't intrigue me at all in the context of what Paul is writing here. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about at all. And so I think in all those countless hours and hours and hours in grad school, we were just completely missing the, the plain thrust 
of what was going on as Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. So what is Paul writing to the church at Philippi? I want to go back and pick up our story from last week. Last week, you remember, I talked about the city of Philippi and kind of the history of it. So I want to... um, I want to kind of take us back there. So this is Paul's missionary journey. And you remember uh, he journeys by land and then crosses over by sea. And the first time the gospel is preached in European soil in the history of the world is at Philippi. And it's a Roman colony, a Roman settlement, a Roman town. And so Paul finds a few Jews at the river as is his custom. He, He goes to the Jews first. But by the time he's writing back, Uh, this letter to the the church at Philippi from Rome when he's incarcerated later on in his life. You've got this small community there, small house church that would have maybe a few Jewish converts and then Gentile or Roman converts into this Christian community. Now why were there so few um, Jews that there was no synagogue that they met at the river? What was the deal with this being a Roman colony and why is that really important Well, I I alluded to it last week, but this was originally named after Philip of Macedon, which was Alexander the Great's father when he came through, and um, it was very sparsely populated. It would have been just kind of a small blip on the radar screen, but then you see a big thing take place here, and what takes place is um, the battle that ends kind of the civil war after Julius Caesar is assassinated. Julius Caesar is assassinated by uh, a group of guys called the Liberators that wanted to liberate Rome from uh, Julius Caesar because he had taken on dictatorial powers. Brutus and Cassius are basically the two representatives of the Liberators. And so um, they kind of do this, but Octavian um, and Antony... Uh, are, are generals and, and they kind of are what becomes the second triumvirate. There's another guy that stays in Rome. But so you get these generals that come and they don't like what has happened. They're friends of Caesar. Most of the soldiers were loyal to Caesar. And so they square up and go to war against the liberators, Brutus and Cassius. And the first battle of Philippi, the first day of battle at Philippi is early uh, October of 42 BC. And so you're going to get this battle. What happens at this battle is basically a draw, but Cassius is led to believe that Brutus has lost his kind of um, part in this, in this battle. And because he thinks if Brutus is lost, then all is doomed, he commits suicide, um, which was a faulty move. And then what you end up having is the 23rd or the third week in October, the final battle where Brutus goes up against Antony and Octavian, and Brutus ends up losing, and then Brutus takes his life. So Antony and and, uh, Octavius uh, win, they're victorious, and now you have what's called the uh, the second triumvirate. And that lasts for a while until Octavius goes to war against Mark Antony, Mark Antony uh, is with Cleopatra. He gets kind of isolated by being down in Egypt, having that part of the Roman Empire, and then eventually loses. And um, now Octavius, or Octavian, becomes Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus reigns all the way through the birth of Jesus till about 12 AD, I think is what the date is. And he, you know, a long period of time. So Jesus is born under the reign here of this um, Roman general. So what happens at this battle? So there's a lot of slaves that run and join the forces of Brutus and Cassius fighting against these other two. Uh, You have Roman soldiers fighting on both sides, which is an interesting thing. Not typically the way the Roman Empire grew is by having Roman soldiers on both sides of the battle. And when you see this battle end, there have been huge promises made to both the soldiers on Brutus and Cassius's side of the equation and huge promises made by Antony and Octavian on their side of the equation um, to keep the, the soldiers loyal to their side because it would be really easy, right, 
for a Roman soldier to defect and go to the other side because it's their friends over there or it's, or it's their kinfolk or it's people that they're, they at least share custom with or could potentially have some loyalty with. So you see uh, huge promises of, of land and money to these individuals on both sides of the equation. The war is over. By the way, you see something really interesting. In uh, Plutarch, he writes about uh, Brutus having a dream where it's the evil spirit of Brutus and, and Caesar says somehow in this dream that I'll meet you at Philippi. Or, uh, yeah, Philippi. And then Shakespeare picks that up and Shakespeare then writes that into his play, Julius Caesar. And so you've got uh, Brutus and Cassius, Antony and Octavian, Cleopatra in the background, and you've got Jesus being born, and then Paul, and then Shakespeare, all wrapped up in this map somehow. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> it really doesn't get any better than that. So, so here's the story. So now the battle's over. What do you do when you've got all these Roman soldiers that are looking at you, many of whom just fought against you, and they're saying, um, what are you going to do for us to bring about loyalty? Or we helped you win this war. What are you going to do for us with regard to paying us back for these promises? So when we say that Philippi was settled and became a Roman kind of um, colony here, what they did was they divided this whole land up and they, they gave parcels of land to, to Roman soldiers, to veterans. They basically discharged them out settled them on that land, this became a Roman colony, like a, a Roman city. And so what you see is, and then by the way, they crucified certain people along the Roman road, which was the custom that you always crucify people along the Roman ro road, and slaves that had deserted and fought in this war were crucified along this Roman road. Okay, that's really important, and we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so this city is populated by Roman soldiers. Not just Romans, but Roman soldiers who fight and take sides behind emperors and behind um, generals in, in the Roman custom. And then they live in this land because they were given this land as spoils of war in, in uh, deference to their fighting for the Roman Empire. Okay, what that brings into this equation is if you're if you live near Fort Bragg in North Carolina or Fort Hood I think in Texas what is the culture if you live near one of these places very pro american it's a it's a very militaristic very honor bound very duty bound very patriotic place to live. Why? Because generations that have grown up in that area and the, the population is so stilted toward a certain demographic that you get certain characteristics um, or character traits that come up and really make that city what it is. Does that make sense? So you get a couple generations now of people that are born from or descendants of or inherited their land because grandpa was a soldier and he fought at this battle and he was loyal to Caesar Augustus or ultimately uh, was honored and, and given, given spoils by who became Caesar Augustus. Okay, That's the culture. You got Fort Bragg here. Okay. And so we have to go, kind of go back and look at that and say, what does that mean when we're talking about the gospel to people that have grown up in that culture? And the culture of Greek and then Rome was an honor culture. We don't understand this anymore. We don't have an honor or a duty-bound culture like they had. And when I'm talking about honor, I'm talking about honor and power and glory that is the culture they had. If you look um, at J.E. London's book, Empire of Honor, I've, there's a, if you go to the Kilns, there's a book called um, Heroes. It's a whole book on the history of heroes. That book gets into this a lot. There's also this book, Empire of Honor, The Art of Government in the Roman World. 
And if you really get into studying this, I just want to read a couple quotes um, that the emperor got... The emperor got his officials and his subjects to do what he wanted, uh, and he procured the obedience of subjects, and how subjects and officials could bend uh, their officials to their will was all through honor. What sustained the emperor's authority, the argument really is, is not miracles or superstition, religion, um, or all of uh, military victories, all that factored into it, but ultimately it was a system of patronage and honor and glory. You followed the emperor because he was the broker of honor. Um, honor functioned as a common currency. It was like money. It was, it was the thing that allowed you to grease the wheels in society, to elevate yourself in society, and that if you took on shame or dishonor, no matter how much money you might have, you would plummet with regard to social standing and your capital, political or social capital, in terms of ability to get things done. Um, final quote here, because I think it's a telling one, is that the Roman government did not imagine itself... Um, as a government in our sense. In other words, it didn't exist to function with regard to policy and administration the way we would expect, well, we used to expect our government to function, right? Uh, it, it didn't function as a government in our sense of government about administration and policy. Its members imagined something more akin to a football league, a realm of glory, profit, and competition and some administration on the side. Can you imagine that game going on? I mean, that's, that's the cutthroat world of politics and kind of power in the Roman world, is that it's all about brokering some sort of regard or glory or honor so that people would follow you and you would then have that authority over them. Does that make sense? Um, this has kind of been a part of culture since the beginning. By the way, there's a lot of interesting, fascinating stories. I think I mentioned before, you get Nero enters the Greek Olympic Games, and he doesn't even finish, I think it was the chariot race, and yet he had himself crowned with the laurel wreath as the winner. You know, And it's, I just think that's one of the most humorous stories of all, all of antiquity to me. Is like, you know, see, the idea of Caesar having um, the Star Spangled Banner played, you know, and it's like, but didn't he not finish the race? You know, like, but yet he won the race. Okay, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go with that, right? But so you have this whole kind of honor, honor thing going here. Um, and, uh, and so um, you've got this, uh, what do we got picture-wise? Any pictures? Um, oh, okay, yeah, I forgot that one. That's, uh, so this is Caesar Augustus. Um, uh, so the Roman Caesars were always depicted, primarily depicted in military garb. Why? Uh, again, because of honor. Always in their, their kind of idyllic sense of youth. Uh, always clean shaven, which was the Roman custom. Uh, the Greeks originally were about beards, and that was kind of the Greek way. And so the Romans differentiated themselves. Their sculptures were always about being clean-shaven and kind of this perfection. Until Hadrian, who was about 100 years later than Augustus, uh, the beard came back in with Roman emperors for two reasons. Right before that, uh, kind of the Greek thing, Greek fashion became back in vogue. And then if you uh, trust ancient sources, Hadrian had uh, scars from acne, and so he wore a beard to kind of cover up the blemishes on his face. But so you had clean shaven uh, all the way, always with the Roman emperors. And if you ever see a Roman statue with a beard, it, was, it e is either Hadrian or uh, the time after Hadrian. And the other way that you would see the emperors would, uh, would be as nudes. And when they were depicted as nudes, it was showing them as Roman or Greek gods, and most of the Roman gods were just the Greek gods under new names, right? Um, and, uh, and so if they were nudes, that was showing them kind of as being a god, uh, and so you kind of see that power. This statue is in 
the hall of, or uh, kind of the courtyard of statues. If you've been to the Vatican, you'll pass through the courtyard of statues to go into the long halls, uh, the hall of, of tapestries and maps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you've got this culture of glory and honor. The other, uh, yeah, let me show you these two pictures. So this is a uh, samurai. In the samurai culture, you have Bushido, which is kind of the way of the samurai. And then as part of that, one of the things that was a part of Bushido was a noble death or noble suicide. If for some reason your honor was going to be at stake, the way you preserved your honor was by committing ritual suicide, which the word here um, was actually taken, um, the etymology of it is actually like a splitting or a spilling of your guts. And so the, the killing with the sword and then going across the abdomen. Um, we don't see things that different. You get Alexander Hamilton in a duel with Aaron Burr, and you see that even in America, for most of our history, we had an incredibly honor-bound, duty-bound culture where you would literally put your life at risk or be willing um, to enter it. I mean, oftentimes, both people would die in a duel like this. Um, you take a bullet, and, and whether you didn't die instantly, you would die in a number of days or if infection set in or those kinds of things. And so we had a very honor-bound culture here as well. For most of history, we see that. So why this matters is because when Paul is writing, he gets to this place and he's saying that Jesus took the glory and the power and the equality with God that he had, and instead of using it for his own advantage, um, just we can leave this up, the picture up for a second, he made himself nothing, okay, um, taking the very nature of a servant, strange, okay, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Now, humility was not a foreign concept here. It was on the opposite end of the spectrum in kind of the Roman and the Greek cultures. So you, you had the power and the glory, but humility was actually the opposite thing. It was when you experienced or you were shamed and you were humbled, you were, you were made to be brought low and you lost all stature. You took on the position of a slave. And a slave in the Greek empire wasn't by race. It was by people being uh, either kidnapped by pirates or whatnot and sold into slavery. Even Julius Caesar, uh, for a brief time growing up, was a slave. He'd been kidnapped by pirates and then he was ransomed. Uh, or you were, you were conquered in military conquest and because you lost in battle, you became a slave. But the whole idea here is one of weakness and one of shame and a lack of positional authority, not somebody you're going to follow, not somebody you're going to worship. And so the idea of humility is very common here, but it's not what you would see set up with regard to a leader uh, or someone that you're going to venerate and, and consider as a god. But then it gets even worse, and it says this, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now when you're writing as a Jew, a lot of uh, people believe that, that this phrase betrays that Paul's stumbling block early in his life as a Pharisee would have been simply this, that, that my Messiah, my Savior, my King in, in the vein of David that's coming to liberate the Jewish people, he could not have died as a common criminal um, under the authority or being manhandled by a foreign occupying uh, force. I, I can't I can't, I can't take that. And so a lot of scholars would believe Paul's saying, that's how I used to think. But guess what? That's what Jesus did. Jesus humbled himself even to death on a cross. And there's something beautifully simple about what that means with regard to where we go when we follow him, that we humble ourselves and that God exalts the humble. And so Paul then after becoming a Christian, would look at the whole pattern of Scripture. Moses going out into the desert, being humbled as a servant, and then being brought back to be used by God as a humble servant liberator. And that the victory comes at the back end, and the blessing comes at the back end, and the liberation comes at the back end of submission and humility. But a lot of scholars believe that Paul is kind of showing his cards here like, man, this was a stumbling block. 
It's foolishness, he says later, this, this idea of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. So it was his kind of own stumbling block. But again, writing to the, the culture of Philippi and the community at Philippi to the, the Philippians, and he's talking about this, and he says, listen, Jesus humbled himself even to death on a cross. He's talking to Romans that are in a glory culture, a glory culture. And when they walk along the road, it's the road where slaves and criminal, uh, criminals are hung on crosses. That Roman citizens don't hang on crosses. People with glory and honor don't hang on crosses. That common, shamed, and disgraced people, slaves who have run away, slaves who fought on the wrong side in a war, um, people who are being punished for petty crimes, people who are being made examples of because they lack power, they lack authority, they lack any kind of honor. These are the kind of people that get put on a cross. Naked would be the argument that most people would bring forward because that was the, the Roman custom. And they get shamed and humiliated. Death on a cross. And so in early church history, you don't see the cross in art. You see the, the ichthus or the fish and, and the letters that really mean uh, Jesus Christos, uh, we, uh, we all theos, you know, Jesus Christ, Son of God, or theos, whatever it is. But it's the Greek formula that spells out ichthus, and that's the, Jesus Christ, Son of God. This is our art form. We can draw it in the sand. And even in places where you don't want to be known as a Christian, you can draw it, and someone can erase it with their foot. And you go, ah, oh, okay, we're good here. Um, that's another Christian. And so this is the early Christian symbolism, is this ichthus or the fish. You don't see the cross coming about till little sporadic instances in late first century and second century, but then not really in art forms dominantly until the third and fourth centuries. And when you do, you see Jesus showing up on the cross in some sort of a, a victory stance, I think. Um, so you see with angels and the halo and clothed and, and you see the imagery um, d uh, denoting this idea of spiritual victory. We're not going to put Jesus on the cross in a suffering posture as if he's uh, going through some kind of excruciating pain which would be humiliating or humbling. We're not going to show him naked because that would be humiliating or humbling. We're going to put him on the cross but as, as a sign of victory. Um, so this is from a monastery uh, in uh, the next one. I'll, I'll just give you the dates on it. Um, so this is St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, uh, a monastery that is famous because a lot of ancient things, even uh, I think the Codex Sinaiticus, which is one of our oldest copies of the Bible, uh, comes from because it was kind of left alone out there in the desert with all the wars that came back and forth. And this is from the 700s. Um, this is what you see later on in church history is something like this. This is Paul Rubens in 1610, his crucified Christ. And uh, after the time of Francis of Assisi, and you see the mystics and a change in kind of the Catholic church, now it's this identification with the suffering of Jesus. And so the art form now takes on kind of this suffering thing. But see how far we've evolved from the time frame of the New Testament and the way that culture would have perceived the cross at that point in time. The cross was a place and an object and a symbol um, of shame. So maybe we can just go back to the normal slide. So what are we, what are we seeing here? That Paul is writing to Fort Bragg and he's saying, hey, the Messiah showed up and he was a Palestinian. And he was five foot one. He, he doesn't look the way you think he's going to look. It's not all about you. It's not making him look the way you want him to look. So that you can worship him in his military garb. Or in a nude statue form. Or whatever it might be. He's not going to be the object you want to worship. He's the person that God sent and the form that God sent him and you accept him as he was 
And not only that, this person that was the second person in the Trinity that came down in power, he chose humility. Oh, and by the way, that's not a new thing. It, it, it shows up in Scripture, brothers and sisters of Philippi. Proverbs 15, says this, Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. Wow. So God sent the second person to come and to show us the way that he'd always been talking about. The second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the one whose name was wisdom. And he shows us that humility comes before honor. Again, in Proverbs 22, 4, it says, Humility is the fear of the Lord. And its wages, what it pays out, the dividends, are riches and honor and life. Wow, this is different. This is not the way we were taught in basic training in the Roman Empire. This is not what my grandpa taught me. My grandpa taught me that Palestinians are lowly people. My grandpa taught me that that you you worship and revere men that do well in the games, not five foot one men, or, or men that get manhandled by other men, or men who end up ultimately being killed or crucified with criminals, not the way a Roman citizen would be. A Roman citizen deserves a clean death, which means by the sword, taken off the head. Not a dirty death. Not a second-class death. And James says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. You want to know what life is really about. You want to know what the Christian way is really about. It's going to show up in your humility. First Peter 5.5, 5, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the, uh, opposes the proud, but he shows favor to, he lifts up the humble. And so just a year or two after Peter writes this, Peter is going to die and he says, I don't want the honor of dying like my Lord died. Shame me fully and flip the cross upside down. I don't deserve it. It's not about me. It's not about my honor. It's about him. And so I don't, I don't want to act as if my sufferings are somehow equivalent with his sufferings His sufferings were so much different. He is so much greater. And so Peter shows that he understands this by saying, literally, in my death, clothe me differently. Wrap this thing up differently. And so bringing it all together, um, because I think if if there's ever been a, a more poignant message, I don't know, Paul is writing and he's saying this. He's saying, hey, listen, brothers and sisters of Philippi, If you get what Jesus is doing, if you get who he is and what he did, if you get what God's story really is, if you want to encourage me, if you want to bless me in this time of imprisonment uh, imprisonment where I'm I'm writing you this letter, then, then here's the thing. Get it right. Put your own agenda aside and begin to come together. Somehow, in humility, consider each other's problems as, in, as important or more important than your own problems and come together, bind yourselves together and, and begin to figure out this dance that Jesus came to birth. If, if you get Jesus, if you get me, then begin to work this thing out. And then he says, you know, work it out in such a high degree. Work it out with fear and trembling. Work it out because the fear of the Lord should make us quake. And he uses this language, fear and trembling, that only shows up in Scripture when we go before, in the Old Testament, before uh, God on the mountain at Sinai, and, and it quaked, and people were afraid. And the book of Hebrews talks about our God is a consuming fire, and that we, we literally are afraid of that, because God doesn't play around. And so Paul says, listen, work this thing out with the fullness of your emotion. Work it out with fear and trembling, because it's God, it is God who works in us, And it's his will that we should fall in line with his good purpose. Read this with me now. Verse 13. 
For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It is God who works in you to will, for you to will, to act according to his good purpose. The question every Christian I know asks is this, what is God's will for my life? I ask that question every day. I ask it without even thinking about asking it. I default to that question. I live inside that question. God, what is your will for my life? What is your will for me today? And I'm always thinking and asking that question that it must be really good and that it's going to lead to glory and that it's going to, it's going to really be about honor and, and pleasure and, and it's going to be what I would want because God gives good gifts. And I ask that question every day in my gut and in my heart and in my mind. God, what is your will for my life? And if that logic were taken all the way to its end, I'm assuming that God has a separate will for all six billion people on this earth today. The God is up there writing a, a, a new script for every single person, all six billion people He's a neurotic God broken up into six billion competing little wills all to bring glory and honor and power and pleasure to every human being that is somehow from the cradle thinking that it really is about me. And the reality is God has one will that's big enough to include six billion people. It's not about what is, what is your will for my life, God, as if God has six billion wills. It's God's will is big enough to include six billion people. So the question is, God, how would you want me to act according to your will? What is your will that I might know it, submit to it, live up in it? That even Jesus, who had all the authority and power and could have claimed the honor, that he submitted up into one narrative, one plan, one will of God, one desire for what God is doing in this world with regard to redemption and reconciliation. And when we understand that, says Paul, he says, lean into that. Begin to work it out. It's baby steps. It's not about me. And it's not about you. And it's hard. And we got to learn this day in and day out. It's baby steps. But together, Paul is saying, if the Christian community doesn't do it, no one will. Together, he's saying, we baby step into it and find unity and begin to express God's will as we do this together. Antioch. Um, I'm, it's baby steps for me. I hate to admit that. I, I, I start every day hoping that God's plan for me is about glory and honor. Um, when I in, encounter suffering, I had, I had I, this week I learned this. Okay? When I encounter suffering or trial, I default to pity, self-pity, sooner than I do praise. Because I see suffering as being out of place. Because God's will for my life is about goodness. All things goodness. Roses start to finish, right? And if God isn't doing that and I encounter suffering or pain or trial, God is broke. Something's broken with God. But shake the genie lamp and maybe fix God so he can get it right going forward. Something's not working. When I have self-pity at my problems or my shame or my suffering or my trials, I'm, I'm showing that my theology is somehow about me and about glory. And when I really understand that that's part of the pathway to blessing, the kind of, ple the kind of blessing that God bestows, then when I encounter suffering, it doesn't feel any less painful. But my response is one, even if it's difficult or done out of faith, born out of faith, it's one of praise. God, I will still praise you. God, I'm weak, but somehow in this weakness, I know that I'm going to be strong, and this is going to purify me. Please send people to encourage me. 
Please send your spirit to refresh me. Please help me sustain in this and endure and persevere. God, help me learn how to share in the sufferings of my Lord. And in doing so, let me learn how to see the suffering and the pain of other people differently than I once did. When we encounter the trials in our life, we shouldn't default to self-pity. It shows a wrong theology. We should default to praise. It's baby steps. We get to do this as baby steps. We get to purify our, our, our theology. And the hardest thing that I think I've been learning recently is this. We all know this, but humility can be the, the, the greatest tool of pride. Right? In acting out with my own self-interest at stake, sometimes I can choose humility because I know it's the best mechanism to get what it is I want, which is the glory or the honor or the power or the recognition. Americans love humble people. We know how to play that card, don't we? Here's the thing. Humiliation purifies humility. Humiliation purifies humility. I can be excited about my own humility. I can be using humility until it hits humiliation. And then I'm not in control of it anymore and it's all about shame. And I, at that point I find whether or not I'm truly willing to bow my head, take the posture of a servant, to literally get slayed, to look bad in front of my peers, to lose in the eyes of the world, but still to follow the path or the plan or the will that God has and my part in that. And so the hard thing I think I've been realizing this week is to follow God, to understand God's will that includes your life, brother and sister, humiliation, um, if Jesus is a part of our equation, humiliation might be part of the formula. So I want to surround myself with people that understand this, that have walked this road, because when I go to the place of humiliation, I want some people on my left and my right that can carry me through. Don't you? I don't think I can do it alone. And so baby steps, we do it together. Let's pray. Father, I'm, I'm challenged by the words that your servant Paul has for us. I'm challenged by just the, the face value reading of those words. I'm, I'm challenged by the way we theologize about mysteries but miss the practical applications. The practical things that are that are always there from the beginning in Scripture, but we, we tend to miss as we read things through our own cultural lenses. God, I confess that I make Scripture and I make your story about me way more than I think I realize or I would want to admit. I, I pray you help me. I pray you help this congregation. I pray that you help us. Pray that you purify us even if it comes through pain, trial, or humiliation. That we may accurately reflect what a group of people gathering in your name could look like, would look like, and that we would be around hopefully to see the blessing that would come from it as other people come to know you and come to know the grace found in your son because of the testimony of our lives. We pray that in Jesus' name.